All right. So we are joined by the illustrious Chris Brown, head of Chip CTO at Swedish in Seattle and rising star in the CTO space. Chris is going to show us a cool left main case and talk a little bit more about reimbursement, which I think is on top of mind for everybody using Shockwave these days. So Chris, take it away, bro. Thanks, Joe. How are you guys? Good, man. Solid. Good. Awesome. I have a case here today. Uh, this is a 78-year-old guy. Uh, has normal renal function, normal EF, doesn't have any other real significant comorbidities. Comes in with sort of progressive stuttering angina, got to the point where he started to have a little bit of discomfort even at times at rest, really taking him a long time for his angina to go away when he's, uh, after he exerts himself, can't do any of his sort of normal ADLs that he wants to do. Uh, and this is the angiogram that uh, was done at one of our uh, our satellite sites. Got, got a, a nasty you know, classified pretty, nodule in the distal left main. Yeah, it's uh, and he's got a little, he's got a lesion in his cirque and he's got some calcified disease in his proximal LED here. So, you know, he's he's got a reasonable, reasonable syntax score is what I would say. And so, you know, he was sent over here to the main center for so we could have a heart team discussion and, you know, for whatever it's worth, uh, this is his syntax two score, which for everybody who doesn't uh, use this a lot, I, what it does is it takes the anatomic part of the syntax and then it adds variables or comorbidities that make you more or less likely to have problems percutaneously versus surgically. And so in his case, this is what his, his heart syntax two score is. So he goes from a 23 to a 26 for the PCI, but he goes up a lot, mostly because of his age. Uh, with the cabbage. And so with the heart team presented him as options, as well as the idea that, you know, I think this is probably a bit of an over-exaggeration on a mortality if you compared it to like an STS score. And ultimately he really didn't want to have a sternotomy and we felt very comfortable that we could treat this percutaneously. Um, hey Chris, can you take a second? Can you just tell us what is your, what is your, the structure of your heart team? Cause everyone says they have a heart team and it's in the guidelines yeah. and stuff, but what do you guys actually do so, for that? What we have is we have, um, I have uh, one, two, three, I'm trying to count all of them. I have five cardio, uh, CT surgeons at our center. Uh, and then we have uh, six interventionalists at our site. And essentially what we do is we try and make sure that every patient that has complex disease uh, at least has a formal note from both parts of the group. And then we try and have like a little side conversation, if you will, uh, amongst each other about it. Uh, so if they ask me, you know, a patient gets referred from an outside center for bypass grafting, I'll still go and see the patient. I'll, you know, write a little note that says what I think the risks are, what we think from a technical standpoint, I'll talk to the patient, tell them what options they have percutaneously and sort of what we think about their restenosis rate, depending on a, a number of factors. And then I'll tell my surgical colleagues and then they'll say, okay. And then ultimately, mostly what we do in, in a contemporary environment here is we let the patients choose most of the time um, because I think that's probably the most appropriate. Now, sometimes they ask us to choose and that's a little bit more complicated um, because I think there are so many things that can be treated percutaneously now with the tools that we have at our disposal. And we have you know, three types of arthrectomy. We have lithotripsy, we have cutting balloons, we have all these things. And so that's sort of how we, we, we do it, though, is we, generally speaking, let the patients uh, make an informed decision. And, and I try and give them the most fair information that I can. Uh, and anybody who's looking for, a, a you know, that kind of data, there's a great talk by uh, Paul Tierstein um, on ViewMedi, uh, which I have no affiliation with. And there's also a great talk uh, by Greg Stone with regard to left main uh, cabbage versus PCI, where they really get down into the nitty gritty of the actual numbers and the differences uh, and they're sort of surprisingly small, the difference between the two strategies with regard to the, the overall outcome. So, Cool. Uh, so we went ahead and did this and i um, just going to go through it here. You know, we obviously always start with imaging. We went ahead and started with um, escalating balloon angioplasty. And then the first cine that you're going to start seeing here is us taking a lithotripsy balloon and what it, we knew here is, is we had a relatively long segment to treat. We got to treat this entire sort of proximal LED before this diagonal. There is a calcified shelf in the ostium of the diagonal, but it's not stenotic. I, did not, I didn't show you that, Ivis. And there is some disease in the LED itself, distal to the bifurcation, but again, neither of which is really obstructive. So we really just need to treat all this calcium in the proximal LED, as well as that huge nodule in the left main. And we know we're going to need a lot of shocks in the left main 
but we also need to make sure that this expands appropriately. The other thing that's going to be, you know, that's a little bit of a caveat here is, of course, that the LED itself is smaller than the left main. And so what we have essentially done is gone with the four millimeter balloon and what we actually think is probably a three five vessel. But because we're only at four atmospheres, I feel real comfortable um, just going ahead and shocking with this balloon, knowing that I'll get better apposition to that nodule as we start to modify it. I really would hate to take a 3.0 or a 3.5 to that nodule, have us, you know, deliver the first 10 set of pulses, start to change the way the nodule's morphology is, and then not really be delivering as much energy because it's kind of floating as we move forward. So I really tend to oversize the balloon to the, uh, when we talk about long lesions here in my distal segment, with the idea that four atmospheres is unlikely to cause significant trauma of any kind other than maybe a small dissection, which we're going to stent anyway. And you can see, you can't see it in this film, but in the next film, you can still see there's that nodular waste, but we, you know, it's modified quite a bit. I mean, I think before I sent it, I delivered maybe three or four sets of pulses here. And, you know, we had used a good bit, maybe a total of 40 or so pulses to do the length of the rest of the LAD, essentially giving 20 pulses and two segments of kind of balloon overlap. But, you know, on the previous balloons before we had C2 plus uh, at our institution, we would have probably ran out of pulses just pulsing this nodule. And I really would like to pulse this both directions because we know that there's going to be osteal disease at this circumflex. Um, and we know that because we ibis it, but we also know that because of the way the morphology of this is. And I think you really have to pulse in both directions when you're talking about these left main nodules, unless you're a hundred percent certain you're going to provisionally treat the side branch and you really don't want to cause any barotrauma at all. And you think that the ostium of it's actually completely preserved and it's a true and true distal left main lesion that has no extension. I find with imaging, that's almost never the case. Um, but of course, you know, there are rare exceptions. And then, so we went ahead and switched here to the circ, uh, did something similar and, uh, you know, got, uh, sort of exactly what we were looking for as far as, um, uh, expansion goes. I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. This is just us re so think, This is something I that I like to do. I think it's an important point, Chris, especially like the only thing worse than leaving an underexpanded stent in a calcified lesion is leaving underexpanded bifurcation in a, in a lesion in a, in right. a bifurcation lesion. And so I, I totally agree with shocking both branches. And, and, you know, you do not want to be surprised when you're doing a bifurcation that you get under expansion that osteo -circ. So I think that was totally smart. Yeah. And my thing jumped a little bit ahead here. It's having a little bit of a, a fit, if you will. I don't know why it's kind of like going through all the slides probably because it's having a little bit of a freak out. But in any case, uh, essentially what we went ahead and did was we treated the mid vessel first. I don't know why this is doing that. I apologize. Let's see if I can help fix it a little bit. We, we secured the mid LED first with the idea that, um, that we would need to come back um, and have some sort of bifurcation strategy, of course, in the left main. And our bifurcation strategy, I was going to try and show you, is a nano crush, which I'm going to try and go back to if I can. Nano back crush. This is, a, this is a millennial term um, I'm not familiar with, Chris. Yeah. Well, so the technique is pretty similar to a DK crush. So we secured the mid vessel just so we don't have a big dissection plane or some crazy thing we have to deal with. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put a stent um, into the circumflex, extending it back to the left main, but the limited, uh, the most limited amount we can. And I don't think I sinate it, but you can see I have a balloon in the LAD that's distal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a one size undersized balloon or a quarter size undersized balloon in this left main here to LAD. And I'm going to take that to a low atmosphere and I'm going to pull this stent up against that with the idea that what I'm doing is just sneaking the stent as close to uh, the minimal amount overhang as possible. And then I'm going to treat the rest of this a lot like a DK crush uh, without the double kiss being completely necessary. Because the amount of stent that I'm going to bend back over in this strategy, in particular, given this angulation, is not a lot. So the recross is not really relevant because I'm not going to go back through a stent that's crushed over the ostium of the artery, I'm just going to crush a little bit out of the corner. Um, and so that's what we went ahead and did here. And I use this uh, quite a bit now. Um, and so this is just us kind of marching through. 
So it's kind of like a reverse tap almost, you know, like it kind of is in the sense that there's no overhanging metal, though, like a tap has where you have this weird neocarina. We will have crushed that into the corner. And that's why I think I like it geometrically a little bit better. Um, But it it, and it it also allows you to maintain access to both branches the same way that a DK crush does. So we went ahead and did that and we crushed ourselves back over. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, deploy our stent um, back to the left main. See if it'll let me move forward. We're gonna unjail our wire and then rewire it. We're gonna pot and do our usual stuff. And then here, I made the decision that, that we had some serious pinch at this large ob- obtuse marginal. So I made the decision to take light balloon inflation and do a kissing balloon inflation, trying to change the sort of geometry of this stent because I had to stent across this. I, we don't have a we don't have there's no stent that was short enough to do what we were trying to do here. And then of course we kissed the left main. Um, as per usual, we went ahead and treated the rest of the, um, circumplex as well. Cause it needed it. Yeah. So everyone's got kind of a handful of bifurcation techniques. They like what, what made you decide to do nano crush here as opposed to like Kulo or DK crush? I know you're probably comfortable with a lot of different strategies. Yeah. You know, I used to do one of two things. I would either DK crush or I would tap everything, um, because the tap was fast and the DK crush was, you know, maybe arguably from a data standpoint better, um, but certainly allowed you to have access to both vessels. So, uh, when I've modified both vessels and in this case, the modification to have these huge lumens. So I have sort of little worry that I wouldn't be able to reaccess, but I don't really like to take that risk if I don't have to. And with this nano crush, because you don't have to do the second kissing inflation, it's not really any longer than a tap, but you get to maintain why wire access to both vessels. And that part I like a lot about a DK crush as far as a two stent strategy goes um, a- a over a tap or a T or a Kulo or whatever. You could maybe argue that you need more structural um, pressure in a, in a left main bifurcation that's heavily calcified. So maybe a Kulo is a good idea, maybe with a sort of a modified Kulo with a short second set of part of the pants. Um, but I find with these Megatron stents um, that you get enough radial strength and structure out of the Megatron itself that I, I don't think that you need that. And I think the the image, you know, the final angiogram kind of gets at that. This is a our final kissing balloon inflation. We have a one repot, which you can't really see here. Um, and then this is our final angiogram. So, you know, as I said, there's a little calcium at the osteum in the diagonal. The rest of the LED has some disease, but we don't want to do anything with that really right now. And none of it's obstructive. And, um, you know, we're just happy we have a, a really well opposed, well expanded stent in the LED extending into the left main. And then we got a good result on the circumflex here. That's gorgeous. Man. And I think, you, want, I you think know, I, go ahead, go ahead. With that nodule to get this much expansion, this with this good a radial force, I, I don't think I need a Kulo. I think, you know, the nano crush ends up working pretty well here. I think a DK crush also would have been fine. Um, it would have just taken longer. And I've really over time, realize that the less time that we're in the room, really the better for the patient, not to the degree that you shouldn't do the best job possible. But if I can find a technique that results in them being in the room for 20 minutes less or something, um, then I, and I can use five less balloons or three less balloons or whatever it's going to take, you know, to recross a DK crush, then I'm going to choose that strategy. So. No, I love it, dude. I think I think the big teaching points is get good at probably two bifurcation techniques. Don't just have one in your bag. Always have a low threshold to atherectomize or ideally IVL because you can use the C2 plus to get pulses on both sides. And then I think, you know, it's malpractice not to do an FKB no matter what. I know there are some operators that skip the FKB or if they struggle with it, they skip it. But I think you have to do an FKB if you're yeah. doing a multiplication strategy. And this is a fantastic freaking result, dude. I agree with the final kissing balloon. I one time saw that skipped and it caused a uh, stent thrombosis because of the, how much metal was mashed up at the ostium, even though everything looked okay. Uh, when we went back in the IVIS after this, and it was a very acute stent thrombosis, uh, despite the patient being anticoagulated. Um, as soon as the heparin essentially drifted, you know, they were loaded with plavix or something. And so that still hadn't taken full effect and there was just a lot of metal. And uh, ever since then I have, and even at that time, I really thought we should have done the final kissing balloon inflation. Um, but I think you have to do that at this point. Um, yeah. it, it really is sort of standard of care to make sure that it's the best it can be. Um, so we're really happy with that. I think there are two things about this that are kind of unique. The first is, I don't think I would have gotten through that nodule with a regular C2 because I used almost 
or, and, or I should say, I wouldn't have gotten through the nodule and everything else I wanted. I used over, I used 90 of the, no, I used, yeah, 90 of the, no, 80 of the pulses um, on the left main bifurcation itself, right? So I used uh, essentially 50 of them left main to LAD, and then I used 30 of them left main to left circumflex. Um, and I think you can see from the scent that the modification of the calcium was essentially as good as you're going to get. Uh, and the scent expansion was as good as you're going to get, especially with such a large nodule like that. Um, and I used the other 40 pulses that I had to do the rest of that LED and get that expanded, which was still pretty heavily calcified. So I think this is a pretty uh, big improvement with regard to getting 50% more shocks per per balloon. I, I think that there were times where I was using a second balloon and admittedly that's just way too expensive, I think long-term um, and just maybe wasn't the most efficient. But now that we have these extra pulses, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, the other thing is supposedly if you wanted to, you could put this in a smaller guide catheter. I'll be quite frank. I, I use pretty large guiding catheters, both for support, but for bifurcation reasons, uh, most, if not all of the time. So uh, that's a li- maybe a little less concern to me. I don't know about you, if you use six French guides or five French guides even, but I generally speaking do most left-sided interventions with seven French guides for the purposes of bifurcations. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think, you know, this, I think your strategy of using a slightly oversized balloon when you have size mismatch and you're planning on shocking two different vessels, I think that's totally reasonable. I think you're pushing it a little bit if it's a millimeter bigger, but I think half a millimeter is not a huge deal. And that, that can, that can allow you to use one balloon for multiple vessels if you need to. Yeah. And you know, I've taken the whole millimeter and I've gone to lower atmospheres even, right? Because all you need is that position. So you could go to two if you want, if you're a whole millimeter off. And almost certainly you will dissect the intima, which again, you're going to put a stent. So I don't think that that matters so much uh, because that'll tack that up. Um, but it's not going to cause a, you know, a traumatic problem. A one millimeter difference at two atmospheres is not going to cause, I don't think going to cause any real significant harm. Um, the other thing that was neat about this was this is the first time or the first case, uh, this year that, uh, we, our system has moved over and I was able to use this new billing code, this nine, two, nine, seven, two, um, which essentially it's just an addition, just like your IBIS code or your FFR code is an addition to your 92928. Uh, it's an addition to your PCI code and it's to anything that you do. So if you would have just did a balloon angioplasty or if you would have done, if I would have needed to rotoshock this um, or if this was a CTO and I was, you know, shockwaving some long right or something, I would have had my C2 plus and I would have probably gotten through the whole vessel, which would have been nice. But, you know, more importantly, I would have gotten to, add this code to it, which I think is important from a professional standpoint in that, you know, this work is difficult and it takes extra time. And, you know, there's all these great operators that are taking extra time to modify calcium appropriately, and they should be, you know, reimbursed for their time and, and for the effort, because it's, it's not easy. And it requires a lot of, a lot of extra work at times with guide extensions and other things. The other unique thing about this is, is, you know, we shockwave two vessels. And so we're going to do this additional work code actually twice um, you can use it once for every major vessel. So I'm going to do it for the LED. I'm going to do it for the circumflex. And theoretically, I guess you could also probably even do it for the left main, although it didn't involve the left main ostium. Um, and then you could use it for the right if you needed to as well. So that's kind of neat. This is the first time I was able to use that code. But you can see it's a pretty big change. I mean, it's about a 30% addition uh, to the RVUs you're getting for the work you're doing. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's an appropriate um, recognition by CMS here. Uh, to allow us to do the right thing for our patients and to, to not have to, you know, worry about the extra time that it takes uh, in our already completely compacted days of clicking through Epic or whatever, you know, sort of computer system you spend all your day on. No, I do. I, I, the three RVUs is great. I mean, I think it's totally appropriate for the the level of complexity of these cases. And you figure, you know, a straightforward PCI is what 10 RVUs and you add on IVIS and IVL. And I think, you know, 15 RVUs is probably reasonable for a complex calcified case. Um, so, I mean, obviously we could always have more money, but I, I think the three RVUs is a big game changer. It's, it's, it's more than some of the other atherectomy devices. And I think um, it's super fair. Yeah, agreed. And you can use it in addition to the other atherectomy devices if you need to. And so I think that's also super fair because if you're doing a rotoshock case, I, you know, your total time spent, it's more than 30% more than a type A lesion. I mean, you might spend literally 100% more time. Um, so it's important that that's sort of recognized. And I think that it's really great that CMS uh, did this. So, Yeah. 
I love it. Chris, that was a great case and a great overview of the new CPT code. Thanks, brother. And, uh, and keep on keeping on, man. You too, man. Have a great weekend. You too, bro. Bye.